guys how are you do all doing I will first of all thank all my subscribers and those who did some book purchases we're back for discussions as usual as I told you earlier on and to answer all the relevant questions you posted but you know due to the data protection privacy and confidentiality act 2018 I will not be mentioning any names here but I will work through you know the questions sent to me in a chronological order as arranged on this video in the meantime I would like to give a brief history of COVID-19 and not to bore you with rhetorics as you all know there are so many um, conspiracy theories about this pandemic everybody is saying whatever they want to say the main topic today as mentioned in the previous video is COVID-19 and how it is, 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 is affected our mental health so we will be deliberating on an anxiety disorder in um, chapter 14 of my book on the pages 98 to 101 so I'll be reading that and then we will discuss it as we go along so let me give you a brief description of what I was talking about in China the coronavirus disease 2019 was first identified in the city of Wuhan and had spread rapidly across the whole country so to control the COVID-19 pandemic the Chinese government had to implement a range of strict quarantine management strategies for different population but you know patients with COVID-19 were isolated in hospitals whereas close contacts and the front liners the medical personnel were quarantined in hotels so it was really a kind of a dying situation that they were in but the whole world they didn't know what was going on but china was dealing with this situation so all the residents were under home quarantine during the peak of the pandemic except those who guarantee the basic functions of the city that's the ministries you know the civil servants and those that governmental so these critical control measures substantially mitigated the spread of COVID-19 with conceivable impacts on people's daily life. So we here, we are using a mental health survey data to test what, whatever the weather, um, whether the mental health problems were related to quarantine or not. So we are trying to get the data through the survey but high prevalence of mental health problems were found in people so which means there's kind of a, a correlation to what is happening so quarantine was not related with the prevalence of mental health problems but that is debatable because as i said earlier on it, there, there's some kind of a link so the impacts on daily life predicted that mental health problems significantly was some kind of a an issue so what I'm going to do right now is to read through the questions and then start reading the chapter 14 that is going to answer most of the questions that were sent to me and then we connect it to COVID-19 and how it's associated with anxiety disorder and I'll be interrelating the facts with the present pandemic pandemonium that is the coronavirus and how all the questions you guys sent to me is related to this present situation so i'll first with the i'll start with the first question um that is what is anxiety disorder what are the classifications of anxiety disorder what are the aspects of its experiences 
Number four, what are the categories of anxiety disorder? The five, what are the clinical screening tools for anxiety disorder? So we've got five now. And the sixth question that was sent was, what is GAD, which is generalized anxiety disorder? So that is basically the abbreviation is GAD and the, the, the whole thing means generalized anxiety disorder. So before I carry on, I will just hint a brief discussion on this coronavirus. There has been so many um, conspiracy theories. Some are coming up with the Americans engineered it, China engineered it. It's, it's all over the place. We don't, we don't even know. Nobody has any evidence. So we, we, we wouldn't even go into it. So what I'm going to do now is to answer the questions first and then we talk about how this whole situation affects our mental health. That's basically what we're going to be doing now. And then we talk a little bit about some of the conspiracy theories that has been around and is spreading. Some are viral, you know, and it's just all over the place. So let me start reading through the, <clears throat> the topic anxiety disorder. And this is going to answer most of the questions that you guys sent. So chapter 14, is the topic is on anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorder is an umbrella term that covers several different forms of a type of common psychiatric disorder characterized by excessive rumination and uh, if you say rumination it means you know a deep or considered thought and that is rumination thought about something if you have a deep if you are in a pensive mood we can call it rumination it's like you are thinking about something that is really very important to you or that bothers you or that concerns you so that's rumination so again it goes on to say worrying uneasiness apprehension and fear about future uncertainties as i earlier you know mentioned either based on a real or imagined events so it can either be based on real or imagine what events so people imagine stuff is like a mirage you walk to that place and you find out there's nothing there you, you see some kind of like a water surface you walk there and you see there's nothing there so you can imagine things which it doesn't even exist so let's get let's get on with it so which may affect both physical and psychological health so the physical health and the psychological health but then I would want to touch a little bit on the physical. When it comes to the physical symptoms, somebody can be going through anxiety disorder and be sweating, be panicking, palpitation, and sweating, as I earlier on said, even to the extent of having headaches. So what that means is that it alters your chemistry, and you know, your brain is the box, is the computer of the whole body. So when there is any imbalance in the chemistry, it affects most of the organs in your body. So we have the liver, it can affect the liver. We have the kidney, it can affect the, the kidneys. You have the heart, it can affect the heart, sometimes even giving you high blood pressure because you are thinking about something that's not there or something that bothers you. So these are some of the physical symptoms that you're going through, palpitation of the heart, high blood pressure, headache, you know, even sometimes you become a little bit dizzy. And the psychological health is, that was what I was describing about your mental faculty when the chemistry of your brain is altered. And then you start going through thoughts. Some of them even have visual hallucination and start talking to themselves and all kind of 
different different issues but we will go through as we go along so there are numerous psychiatric and physical syndromes and um, we'll expand it you know a group of symptoms which is consistently occurring so the numerous psychiatric and men, uh, medical syndromes which may mimic the symptoms of an anxiety disorder such as hyperthyroidism so the hyperthyroidism which may be misdiagnosed as generalized anxiety disorder so what that means is hyperthyroidism is an overactive thyroid that's what it is overreactive um, thyroid anyway I just want to touch on a little bit of something here you know um, English is not my first language but you know I'm trying to make it work my my my, my, my language is Akan that is tree but you know so when I make certain mistakes or anything like that you know just ignore that because I'm even supposed to speak in, in, in tree in my language because I cherish my tradition and my culture but then you know as we're going along I'll be making some kind of pronunciations if it's not clear please forgive me but we are all learning so let's carry on so the hyperthyroidism is just an over active thyroid so which means the thyroid function in your body is just a little bit overreactive. That's what it means. So it is where the thyroid gland produces too much of the thyroid hormones, which can affect your daily activities or your metabolism, your daily metabolism. Sometimes when it's low or high, you put on weight because your metabolism is slow. So when you eat, you know, the digestive system is a bit sluggish. So you really can't get all these nutrients that you need and then the fat is kept somewhere and you start putting on weight it doesn't burn your fat so you put on weight so that is what it means so when it comes to anxiety and alteration of chemistry in your brain it brings a whole lot of diseases a whole lot of things and when your brain is not really functioning well you know what it means it affects most of the organ that is why we have all these cancers we have all these no more Parkinson's disease, all this type of thing. Because your brain is a box, is a computer of your whole body. So it operates in such a way that it tells every organ what to do at a certain point in time. So that is how it works. Okay, let's carry on. Individuals diagnosed with an anxiety disorder may be classified in one or two categories based on whether the experience continues or episodic symptoms so which means that if your experiences is continuous that is when it's getting clinical it's getting biological they have to really go and do some tests to see if you really need some kind of support because we all have anxiety anyway but if it goes to the extreme then it means you need some kind of support or assistance sometimes your doctor may diagnose you and then they will give you some medication to you know calm you down give you some medication to help you cope with the situation and then when it comes to the episodic symptoms it means sometimes it's sporadic it comes on and off sometimes it's frequent so the episodic there that I've written means that sometimes you have sort of isolated incidents from time to time let's carry on so this has at least answered about two or three questions. But, you know, after reading from 98 to 101, I think everything will be sorted. And then we can deliberate on the conspiracy theories of the COVID-19 and how it's affecting us. Because obviously, anxiety disorder, and as I'm going to go on and talk about the first type, which is the GAD, generalized anxiety disorder everybody goes through that a certain point in their life but then it depends on how you cope it depends on your coping mechanism it depends on the strategies that you develop personally to be able to deal with that situation you get what i'm saying so 
let's carry on and see how it goes and then i'll touch on the pages as i said 98 to 101 and then when i finish that we, we carry on so current psychiatric diagnostic criteria recognizes a wide variety of anxiety disorders so there are so many types of it so it's up to your clinician to sort of narrow it down to the specific one that you're dealing with but if it's not a clinical issue then at least everyone has a little bit of a percentage of that that we all go you know try to deal with it on a daily basis Recent surveys have shown that as many as 18% of the Americans and 14% of Europeans may be affected by one or more of them. So this statistics, this statistics is I'm talking about clinical issues. It's not talking about you know the population and how individuals go through their daily life with anxiety here and there so this is a study that showed the clinical sort of cases let's carry on the term anxiety covers four good aspects of the experiences that an individual may have so we first of all we're touching on the experiences right now so it has four aspects of experiences before we go into the types and then we pick the one that we're going to be talking about today and after that we go on with the COVID-19 how it affects it. So the first experience, sorry, the first experience or the first aspect of the experience is mental apprehension mental apprehension which means anxiety anyway is the fear of something if you fear that something is going to happen or if you are in that kind of fear in that condition in that situation that maybe i'm going to get a, a car crash or maybe i'm going to lose my money or maybe i'm going to lose my child or i'm going to get ill because of something you know there are so many things that are happening in our lives on a daily basis Maybe the fear of losing your job, the fear of losing your marriage, the fear of losing a partner, the fear of, you know, um, losing some kind of investment that you've done. So it's, it's over and over again, all over the place. Everybody has a little bit of something to worry about. That is a question without a doubt. You will definitely have something that bothers you in your daily life. So that's mental apprehension, which everyone goes through it. But then when it gets on to that sort of stage for a long, when it lingers on for a period of time, then it's becoming a clinical issue. It's becoming a major issue that you have to deal with it because everybody, every individual you know, globally, the whole world, every individual goes through some kind of mental apprehension, the fear of something, you know, on a daily basis. But then it depends on your threshold, how you can cope with that, how you can manage it, your management skills, your coping mechanisms for you to be okay with that situation. So, physical tension, that's number two. And... Physical tension, sometimes when people go through anxiety, you can have muscle ache. Your muscles will be aching. Sometimes even I have an experience when I used to write exams. The first question, before I, I answer the first question, is, is, is general because everybody goes through, you know, specifically something. So with me, when it comes to muscle tension or physical tension, what was happening to me was that when it's time for me to answer my questions, especially during exams time, I'll get the paper, read through the questions. You know, you have to hit on the easy questions first so that you'll be able to finish all because when you start with the hard questions, you'll not be able to finish with, with, 
with the whole questions that you have been provided. So you attack the easy questions first. That's what I tell my daughters that, you know what, when in times of exams, make sure you hit on the easy, soft questions first so that your speed is going to be very, you know, consistent. So what happens is that when I get my pen and start writing, because of the anxiety and tension and the fear of maybe failing the exams or the fear of not being able to answer the questions properly or the fear of forgetting some of the, you know, the information that I have to answer the questions, I start panicking a little bit. And that's what we call panic attack. So when the panic comes like that, the physical tension that I have is a muscle sort of turbulence, trembling. I start trembling. So I start writing. Answering the questions, I know the information, but I'll be shaking. I'll be shaking like that for a period of time before all the tension goes down, all the anxiety goes down, all the panic attack goes down, and then I'll be able to do all my answers and write without shaking. But for the first five to ten minutes, I shake. That's what we call the physical tension. You get through it. Some even throw up. Some palpitate as I earlier mentioned you know individually goes through different kind of some even fit those who have you know epilepsy so it's a very worrying situation but it's everywhere okay so the third one is physical symptoms and I think I've mentioned that as well and the fourth is dissociative anxiety so what happens with that dissociative anxiety is something that you're thinking about that is not even part of your worries, but you get some panic attacks on that. Maybe you are thinking about traveling in about two months' time, but you start beginning, you, you begin to have that effect on you. And you begin to feel very uneasy because maybe you have a phobia of flying like me, I start panicking from maybe a month to my fly date. So everybody has their own story to tell. But, you know, as we go along, let's hit on this briefly. Let me answer the questions as I go along and then we bring it to a close. So individually, everybody has their own sort of phobia that is acting as a dissociative anxiety. You haven't even gone to board your plane. You haven't even, it's not even the date yet, the departure date yet, but you're still worried because you have the phobia of flying. So you can see what the D-Day, when you are going, you're actually going to, you know, you've done all your checking and everything. And you, you get to the airport and you're doing your checking, the, the, the last final one in your bags, in your luggages and everything what you go through and then when you get on the flight oh my god what you go through internally but people wouldn't notice that you are sort of internalizing and dealing with some demons that is within you you know you have to deal with it because there's no option so people go through a lot of things that I'm, I'm giving my, 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 my own example so that is that so anxiety disorder is divided into generalized anxiety disorder, phobic disorder, that's, uh, that's what I, I mentioned right now, and then panic disorder. So it's like, it's all interrelated. You can't, sometimes you get this three in one. You can't keep one away or isolated away from the other. So you see, it's all packed in one stuff. Generalized anxiety disorder that is, you, you'll be going through that, oh, I'm going to be traveling, you know, and the, the phobic disorder drops in as well. And the fear of flying is going to haunt you for some days before you even go and fly. The panic disorder, you panic. Sometimes I sweat. When I panic, I sweat. And then I have headaches. So which means that it raises, you have some kind of palpitation, it raises your, your heart rate. So you have a little bit of high blood pressure. So every individual goes through a little bit of something. But if it goes to the stream or if it lingers on for a period of time, then it's, 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 it's heading into the clinical stage, which obviously you have to book an appointment with your general practitioner, your, your doctor, 
and then they will support you from there. Maybe you need medication to cope with it. So, each has its own characteristics and symptoms, and they require different treatment. So, as I mentioned earlier on, every individual goes through their own thing. But if you need some sort of treatment, then it means it has, you know, been there for quite a long time and it's consistent and it's not any kind of isolated incident. So, the emotions present in anxiety disorder range from simple nervousness to bouts of terror. So, you can be nervous, as I was saying, you'll be shaking. You are nervous that you're going to fly because I have the phobia of flying. I'm using myself as an example. I don't want to come in and, you know, give examples of others. I can, you know, pop in and chip in a few um, external examples. But I want to use myself so that, you know, I understand myself. I know how it, it works with me. So when you are nervous, you, 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 you become very uncomfortable. And that was what I was talking about, the brain chemistry. When it alters, everything goes wrong. It sends error messages to all the various organs of your body. Your kidneys, your liver, your heart, your spleen, your pancreas, you know, your digestive system. And the hormones also play up. Your enzymes that helps you to digest also play up. Everything goes actually kind of wrong. And that is why we have stress-related diseases like cancer, um, tuberculosis is, is spread within, um, spread by contacts and other stuff. So let's, let's leave that aside. You know, stress-related diseases, anxiety that I was, I'm mentioning now. So let's carry on with this. Standardized screening clinical questionnaire, you know, there are so many tools of diagnostics that is used on the clinical level to come up with that diagnosis. So such as Taylor Manifest Anxiety Scale, that is another tool, as a tool that is used to diagnose anxiety disorder. Or the Zang self-rating anxiety skill is another tool that is used to diagnose anxiety. So it's kind of answering the questions as we go along. That can also be used to detect anxiety symptoms and suggest the need for a formal diagnostic assessment of anxiety disorder. So these are the, some of the tools that is used on a clinical level to sort of establish the fact that you have a clinical anxiety disorder. And there are so many questions in that tools, you know, the extent of the period of time, the duration that has been going on, that is the key to the diagnosis. And your symptoms, your physical symptoms that you feel when things like that start happening. You know, nervousness and your phobia also drops in as you go along. And what actually happens when that happens to you? So all these, there are so many design questions that will bring about the diagnosis. And then you have to study the person for quite some time before... Um, the diagnosis happens. But in the, my field of work in mental health, some of them break down with maybe depression and come in. As soon as you come in, you are admitted on section two, which is a um, period of um, assessment, admission and assessment for 28 days. So they're going to treat you, treatment and assessment for 28 days. They're going to check and then assess you for that period of time to see if there's something actually hidden so that they can come up with a diagnosis. 
And if it's diagnosed, and maybe you are showing signs of maybe challenging behavior in that kind of area, maybe you're going to be put on Section 3. And Section 3 is treatment and assessment for six months. They're going to treat you and still assess you for that period of time. And then make sure that you stick to your treatment regime for that time to see that you're going to be recovering. Okay, so we're going to be discussing the generalized anxiety disorder for today. And then maybe carry on with um, the rest of the types or classifications later on in my next video. So watch out for that. Generalized anxiety disorder, as known as GAD, G -A -D, is a common chronic disorder characterized by long-lasting anxiety that is not focused on any one object or situation. So which means that, as I earlier mentioned, everybody has GAD, but it's going to take a consistent GAD generalized anxiety disorder in your lifetime for you to be diagnosed, for you to have that clinical support and help from the doctors or the general practitioners. So it's not focused on any kind of objective or situation. So which means everybody has some kind of an iota, decimal fraction of it. But we all deal with it on a daily basis unless it's becoming a problem that is consistent. So those suffering from generalized anxiety disorder experience non-specific persistent fear and worry. So it's none what specific. So you can't even put your finger on it. Any little thing comes to give you panic attack. You can't even acknowledge it, but it's happening. So which means your chemistry is altered. So it's persistent fear and worry. You fear about losing your job. You fear and worry about your children and all that. Maybe there's nothing is even happening, but because you have that kind of disorder and your brain is not sort of assimilating and recognizing, acknowledging the present situation and is thinking about different kind of thing, you start fearing for your life fearing for things that are around you so so the fear and worry comes and then and and become overly what concerned with everyday matters so that is what i was talking about when it comes overly concerned when you are overwhelmed with that situation and it's consistent overly concerned so which means that you can't even cope with that little situation and manage it so when it happens like that then it means you are you or you need some kind of assistance you need some kind of help it's not it's not that straightforward of course it has been persistent and it's overly concerned so according to um, scatter Gilbert and Wagner's book of um, psychology the second edition Generalized anxiety disorder, disorder sorry, is characterized by chronic excessive worry accompanied by three or more of the following that I'm about to mention. So these gurus that wrote that psychology book have given us some three or more following symptoms that you can, you know, use to detect if there's God generalized anxiety disorder so one is rest restlessness some of the times individuals become very restless and they don't even know what they are doing they will walk from point a to point b they will start exhibiting some kind of ocd which is obsessive compulsory disorder kind of cleaning up all the area washing and doing stuff that they're not even supposed to do and as part of the restlessness you, you you start washing combing doing things repetitively and fatigue is another one the fatigue is 
you know, being lethargic, very weak, you know, you just don't have the strength to do anything. You are tired, basically, knackered and shattered. You know, you, you, you can't function as, as normal. So that's the number two symptoms. Concentration problems, especially if you are in a high ranking sort of position and job. So if you can't have the ability to concentrate on what you are doing, you'll be making a whole lot of mistakes. If you're a solicitor and you have to deal with some kind of a problem that needs going to court and defending, you know, your client, how are you going to do that when you start having concentration problems? Because you need to digest and digress the, the story or the problem at hand. And you have to find plausible solutions to it. And if you don't have the mindset, how are you going to be able to deal with it in the first place? You can't concentrate. You can't even read for, for 10 minutes. So it's, it's quite a very sort of hard and tight situation, but people sort of brush it off all the time, especially those with clinical issues and then can't cope with it. They think, oh, it's normal for me to have sort of lack of concentration. No, it's not normal. It's the chemistry of your brain that is playing up. So you need some sort of help. Irritability, and that is a basic, normal, fundamental sort of symptom. Everybody gets irritable from time to time, but when it gets overboard, then it means that you need help, you need support. You get angry at anything that is thrown at you, just even a question that how are you doing, you get pissed off. You just don't want to talk to anybody. And that also brings isolation because when you are irritable, you don't want to go into the public or into your friends or into your family at that particular instance or moment to start throwing your weights about, to start insulting people because you are, you are pissed off or something or you are angry with no excuse or with no meaning. That is what it does because your chemistry is altered. So you get irritable at any time that you, you, don't, you don't even like it, but it happens. So what do you do? You need support. You need help. If you have a, a family member, your partner or your kids, you can talk to them. And then you can seek professional help as well. You can phone in or work to, because of the current situation in here in the UK, you can't even work for any appointment. So all you do is to pick up your phone call your surgery, your GP surgery, book an appointment. It's, it's definitely going to be a phone appointment. And then you talk to your doctor. They will tell you that, okay, we booked you an appointment for such and such date and time. Your doctor is going to call you. So when the doctor calls you, you know, you talk through it with your doctor, tell your doctor the symptoms that you're experiencing. And your doctor will definitely give you advice and then when it needs some kind of a diagnostic sort of processes, it's going to talk you through it, whether you have to meet or whether it's going to talk to you through the phone. And then if there is any kind of medication or anything like that to bring you down on that panic level, you go through that. So that is it. Muscle tension, as I said, you, you're going to be stiff. Sometimes you, you, you'll, be, you'll be shaking and you'll be very uncomfortable. And when that tension comes, when the muscle is tense, sometimes it aches as well. So you have body aches all over. Sleep disturbance, which is called apnea. Sleep, no, it's different. Sleep apnea is different. Um, this is called, um, sleep disturbance is, um, I, have, I have literally forgotten the name, is, Insomnia, sorry, yeah, insomnia. So sleep disturbance, some of us, some of, you know, people going through the same sort of situation, sometimes you can't sleep. So you have sleep disturbance, sleep disorder, insomnia. You can't have a very prolonged, quiet, and normal sleep. 
and sleep is very very important because if you don't have a very good sleep it affects most of your organs and you can have high blood pressure when you don't sleep well you can even have stroke when you don't sleep well you know because it brings about tiredness tiredness brings about irritability you'll be so angry at anything that is thrown at you you have muscle so all the factors that i've mentioned you go through all that if you are not sleeping properly and those with sleep apnea you need some kind of a clinical intervention for you to have a proper good sleep so that you don't go into that situation whereby maybe you'll be having stroke or high blood pressure or anything that is going to cripple you and you'll be in bed you know for a few a period of time so sleep disturbance is really something one of the symptoms that we have to be looking at because you need a proper sound sleep even if it's five hours and it's a sound one by the time you wake up you will feel good in yourself you will feel good in yourself so that's one of the symptoms so let's carry on generalized anxiety disorder is the most common anxiety disorder to affect older adults that is is like basic and it affects everybody but some are clinical some need more help than others some can control it and some can manage it they have their own coping mechanism they have their own management skills that they you know deal with it on a daily basis so that's the statistics right there anxiety can be can be a symptom of a medical or substance abuse problem and a medical professional must be aware of this so when it's drug induced when it is substance abuse which is drug induced some kind of generalized anxiety disorder and you have some kind of help from the professionals out there you need to be very plain and very blunt and be very critical with that don't lie about what you do behind closed doors because they need to know all that little information to be able to determine to be able to go through the diagnosis to, to come out with something that is going to help you as an individual because every individual is unique in their own way when somebody is going through God and maybe it's person A the symptoms that person A is going to develop or is going to go through is going to be different from person B so if you don't tell your story to the professional they can't help you so please if it's been consistent and it's been sort of become overly of a concern overwhelmed with everything on your daily activities then it means you really have to be very clear when it comes to transparency you have to be very transparent to the clinician because if you don't tell the clinician that oh maybe I smoke Indian ham from time to time or maybe I take crack cocaine or maybe I do a lot of coffee or I take in heroin or I take in some over over overdose of some kind of a of tablets sorry so you need to be clear and you need to be transparent you need to be honest to your clinician because if you ain't honest you're not gonna get your problem solved because if they're gonna give you some kind of diagnosis and then you hide your information how are they going to know if they're gonna they have to give you some kind of medication to curb down your situation they'll give you the wrong kind of medication or they'll give you the wrong kind of diagnosis and it's it's, it's almost everywhere most of the times wrong diagnosis are everywhere all over the place especially with mental health if your psychiatrist doesn't have the, the the genuine information and you are not being monitored and studied for a period of time you're gonna get a wrong diagnosis and that won't help in your treatment because if they give you a wrong medication for that kind of thing and that is not even helping you how are you going to deal with that it, it can sometimes even worsen 
your situation. So that is that. So a diagnosis of God, generalized anxiety disorder, is made when a person has been excessively, as I was saying, worried about an everyday problem for six months or more. I've said it earlier on. So before they diagnose you with God, it means you've been having the, 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 the symptoms consistently for over six months. That is where it goes into the clinical area. You need support. You need help. So if you are experiencing that, please go and get help. Because everybody has a little bit of something that goes on every day, worries and all the anxiety and problems here and there. But if yours is excessively worrying and it's lasted over six months, please go for help. So a person may find they have problems making daily decisions. Aha, that's where it starts. Daily decisions. So your brain, the alteration of the chemistry is making it hard for you to decide on what to do, especially if you're a business person and you are going through that phase and nobody knows about it. And you wake up in the morning and you want to try and organize yourself and go to work. Or organize yourself and put things in order to maybe do some orders and, and check your account and see if things are happening for you you don't even have the mindset to even solve that problem just that simple problems so that is when you have to notice that no there's something not right you need some kind of a help so daily decision making and remembering commitments as a result of lack of concentration and preoccupation with worry so if you are preoccupied with so many things that is very unnecessary that is not even relevant to your daily chores or to your daily business activities then it means there's something not right you need to have it checked out so you can see that everything here that i'm saying will obviously you know um find its way into this present situation of the COVID-19. Because if you are worried that you're going to die if you catch that disease, <laughs> obviously, if you don't have the mindset to sort of control it and know that, okay, it's an isolated sort of case, if I have to go and, 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 and contract it, I have to come into contact with somebody before I catch that disease and all that. So you, you, you yourself is going to assess it and be very calculative and, and, and put measures in place personally so that you wouldn't sort of catch it. But if it's preoccupying you and nothing has happened yet and it's consistent, then there's something happening. So you need to call for help. So let's carry on. So appearance looks strained with increased sweating, as I said, from the hands, feet, and the axillaries. You, you know your joints so i said earlier on you sweat when you are nervous your appearance look tense you know you look tired as well you don't look well your friends will see you what, what's happening to you? you you don't look well you don't you don't look happy you are preoccupied with some kind of thoughts that is eating you that is tearing you apart and you need some kind of support some kind of help you need to go for help may be tearful sometimes tears you cry tearful which can suggest depression before a diagnosis of anxiety disorder is made physicians must rule out drug induced anxiety and other medical causes so these two must be ruled out drug induced as i said earlier on and then medical issues if you have some kind of uh, biological or medical issues, your heart is not functioning well, your kidneys, you have CKD, chronic kidney disease, your liver, cirrhosis, or you drink too much and all that, they have to establish all that to make sure that your organs are functioning well. You don't have any underlying issues that will bring about your alteration of your mental chemistry 
So they have to know that. So tearfulness is a sign of depression. But it is also part of anxiety disorder. So, you know, mental illness is kind of all interrelated in some kind of a way. You say one, and then one comes to click on it. So they are like puzzles that fix themselves together. As you go along with that kind of symptoms, another symptom follows, another symptom follows, and it's all intertwined. So I think um, chapter 14, and then the pages 98 to 101, I've answered, you know, the questions that was placed on my page. And now I would want us to talk a little bit about the COVID-19, how this generalized anxiety disorder, how this situation affects us, our mental being, health, mental health. So I'll first of all start with some of the... Um, conspiracy theories. Some are saying that this COVID-19 was developed way back in 2002. And then um, it, it, it didn't even have the potency of spreading like what we are experiencing now. So it was some kind of a brief era and it passed. And then somewhere in 20, 20, 2006, 2007, the same thing happened. Some kind of fluish um, virus also came around and it vanished in a way. It didn't spread globally. And come the COVID-19, as the conspiracy theories uh, all over the globe are saying, that it developed it. That's why it's got the year 19 to it. So it's 2019. It was um, genetically modified and engineered in 2019 in the laboratory in Wuhan. One of the theorists say that. One of the theorists also say that it came in a lab in America, a military um, base somewhere in America that they developed it. So it's all over the place. You know, we don't have any evidence. We are all just saying what we hear, what is going viral from time to time. So everybody's saying what they want. So the Wuhan one, that is what caught the eye of the world. The Wuhan um, COVID-19, as the conspiracy theory may say that it was developed there, it was engineered there and it became very potent and it's got RNA and DNA, so which means it's adaptable it's, it can mutate it can multiply, it's a virus and it's dangerous it's, it's, it's adaptable to heat it's adaptable to you know, all kind of surfaces so that was developed in Wuhan as the conspiracy theory will say. So there was some kind of mistake and then it got out there. It started killing people. And they didn't even know the actual sort of symptoms that was really destroying the mass. So as China had the first kind of victims, they started mass burying them. So the whole world didn't know what was happening. When China made announcement of what is going on in their cities, globally, they were shut out because they didn't even know that it was going to spread so quickly like that. But by that time, Chinese had traveled all over, all over the world. So it, it, it's spreading all over. But they didn't know. When it started hitting USA, hitting Europe, hitting all the other places, that is when they realize that they have to be serious with what China is coming about, what China is talking about. So that is when the whole thing became pandemic. 
and globally they started orchestrating and fighting it together because now they knew that it wasn't the problem of China it was the problem of the world everybody needs their gloves on to start dealing with the present situation so how does this whole thing affect our mental health it does because everybody is anxious you will be very anxious when you hear that this virus kills in a minute and people are you know placed on ventilators and still they die so it's a very anxious kind of era that we are in at the moment so obviously generalized anxiety disorder is going to play a major role in our communities so that is how i'm saying that it affects our mental health because the fear of contracting that disease the fear of dying when you have it the fear of losing your loved ones the fear of your kids catching it the fear of your family members catching it the fear that you're gonna lose your job that people are even at home we are all quarantined you, you, you can't go to work they are easing it a bit in sort of a graduated approach so that it's not going to be um, very dangerous because when they don't have a graduated approach in some kind of easing the lockdown then when there's a surge there's a rise in the um, the, the, the affecting population when there's a rise it's going to be a problem so when the government puts down sort of management strategies to make sure that we contain it's called containment strategies so that it doesn't explode that more people will have it that more people will die at the moment more than 46,000 people have died and I think it's more I don't even have the statistics so don't even bother with my um, figures there are more 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 people and I think we are into into the millions and it's very dangerous so obviously it's going to affect our mental health definitely affect our mental health because the fear of what I've mentioned is just the foundation that's the fundamentals of anxiety because if you are afraid of being um, having this disease obviously you'll be anxious and it's going to be some kind of a little bit of a disorder because your brain is going to tell you that hey when you have this disease you're gonna die you're gonna lose your family and then the quarantine as the topic as I'm talking about when you're home you're not doing exercise you can't go out and exercise because all the gyms are closed if you don't have your personal treadmill and some kind of a gadgets to work on it and exercise if you can't go out to shop if you have got underlying issues if you can't work for your daily bread then it means that you're gonna get yourself into a big trouble so I'll end here and then we continue with this quarantine business how it affects our mental health and then we will discuss on this COVID-19 on my next video so subscribe and then hit on the notification button for to get alerts whenever the next video comes so I'll be going into the quarantine and how it affects our mental health on the next video so that we will digress and you know digest and then dissect all these relevant issues surrounding quarantine and how it's affecting us some have lost their jobs some are into financial constraints some have difficulties even going out to to shop because they are they've got underlying issues if you don't have any support from your family members and all that we will going to, we will be going into that and then you know discussing this issue so thanks for watching i hope it was informative enough it was educational enough so 
um, watch out for the next video that we're going to be discussing a bit further on what is happening right now. Take care and have a good weekend and make sure that you subscribe to the government's containment strategies so you don't go out without a mask and all that. You know, follow the rules and make sure you keep yourself and your family safe. Thank you for watching.